Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, we continue the Timberwolves big board. We get ever closer to the number 19 pick. We're into the late lottery now. Some potential 3 and D options and players that would be plug and play defenders for the Wolves if they were able to move up just a little bit and select them in this year's draft. It's all coming on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by Arcade One Up. Bring home a slam dunk, introducing NBA Jam Shaq Edition from Arcade One Up. Pre-order now to play with legends. Arcade One Up is the place for authentic gaming experiences featuring licensed retro games from the golden age of arcades. Happy Tuesday, everybody. This is part four of the Timberwolves Big Board here on Lockdown Wolves. Talk about three prospects today. And also, real quick here at the top, uh, a, a reiterated Timberwolves rumor that's out there. First of all, thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Lockdown Wolves is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as Apple, Google, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves. That's at Lockdown T Wolves. Don't forget the T and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right. Uh, I want to get into the big board real quick. Kevin O'Connor of the ringer kind of slipped into his latest version of his mock draft. Uh, a matter of fact, note that the Timberwolves are, are currently shopping D'Angelo Russell. Let me actually get the exact phrasing. I think that's what it was. He said, uh, D'Angelo Russell is being shopped around. And so then he goes on to talk about how the wolves could look for a shot creator at number 19 in the draft. Uh, this was of course picked up. D'Angelo Russell tweeted uh, something about how he's out shopping, um, obviously referencing that. So it, it's out there a little bit. But it's also not a surprise, right? We knew this from the start of the offseason. I did a couple entire shows about, hey, the Dolls are going to shop D'Angelo Russell. All it takes is one. I still kind of don't think they're going to be able to trade him this offseason. And I don't think they're desperate to trade him either um, because they were good with him. So, yeah, I think if they can get off his money and not take back too much salary for the future, we've talked a lot about the Knicks as a possibility. There's some pros there. I prefer, you know, like the Clippers would be great. Obviously, there's the Western Conference thing, so maybe not. And maybe L.A. doesn't want another guy who's going to have a high usage rate with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. There, there's a handful of teams we talked about on this show that could be interested for D'Lo. I don't think it's really a new rumor. I think it was pretty obvious the Wolves would be more than open to trading D'Angelo Russell. But that's out there. That's Kevin O'Connor at the Ringer who said that. Let's go ahead and get into the next part of my Timberwolves big board here at Lockdown Wolves. And again, this board is based on who I would pick at these selections if I were the Wolves and not necessarily the top prospects in order. Um, so if, for instance, if I was the Wolves at number one, I'd take Jabari Smith Jr. because he's just that good of a prospect and he'd also fit insanely well next to Carlton Towns. Number two, I'd still draft Chet Holmgren, even though you'd play two seven footers if he played next to Carlton Towns, but he's too good of a prospect to pass up and so on and so forth. So Paulo Bancaro was my third pick. Uh, or would be my third pick. Keegan Murray's fourth on my board, then Shaden Sharp, Jaden Ivey of Purdue, Benedict uh, Matherin, who I really like out of Arizona at number seven, AJ Griffin from Duke at eight. And then today we're going to talk about nine, 10, and 11 on my big board. Um, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do that. Number nine for me, Jeremy Sohan out of Baylor, an intriguing prospect. He's six foot nine with a seven foot wingspan. He's essentially a, a four with kind of point forward ability. Uh, he could play the three or the four in the NBA. The thing that's most appealing about him as a prospect is he could probably guard, maybe guard one through five. I, I don't know if he'll be able to guard ones at the NBA level. He was able to do it in college. Uh, there's going to be some point guards that I think are going to be a little quick for him. But the combination of his size and his lateral quickness is very rare. Um, he's a bulky, a bulky player but not in a bad way. Um, he's also very aggressive, which makes life difficult for smaller guards when he switched onto them uh, because he doesn't just simply kind of try and contain. He's also aggressive. It could get him into trouble sometimes with gambling for steals on the ball as well as off the ball. Uh, foul trouble could be an issue at the NBA level, but really he's completely switchable. And obviously most teams right now at the NBA level are trying to switch most things. The Wolves mix that in a bit in their defensive coverages towards the end of the season. 
Um, and if they want to continue switching, I know Chris Finch has talked about it's not his preference, uh, but the players like to switch and, and it'll, I think always be a part of, it'll be an option obviously in the Wolves arsenal defensively. Uh, but Sohan would be great at that. He's also generally, I, I mentioned he does gamble. He's generally smart when it comes to, to jumping passing lanes, but it can be an issue. Um, so really he's completely defensive, defensively versatile. He's your prototypical defender in today's NBA. He's going to be able to guard two through certainly two through four and some fives and ones. Truly. He's the only guy so far that I've talked about in this draft who really could do that. Um, and he's one of the better defenders in the entire draft um, in the half court. He's got really good touch. He could be a good cutter. He could be a lob threat. He's a good enough athlete. He could play in the dunker spot and just kind of hang out there. Um, and he's got good enough touch. We're not talking about a Jared Vanderbilt situation. He's somebody who can score um, in the paint with more consistency. It could do more than just play in the dunker spot, but he could be very good there. He did that at times with Baylor. Um, he, he can also handle the ball a little bit. I mean, you're not, I mentioned earlier, you kind of see him as a point forward type. I don't think he would initiate that much offense with Minnesota, but in some ways, similar to Jared Vanderbilt where Vando can actually handle the ball. Okay. Um, it actually, when I was watching Jeremy Sohan, he reminds me a little bit of, and this is a, a little bit of a, a throwback now, I guess a decade in terms of draft years. Well, and also real years, but 10 years, I think it was 2012 draft Royce white, uh, who of course played a couple seasons at, uh, at the university of Minnesota, finished his college career with Fred Hoiberg at, uh, Iowa state and was drafted in the first round by the Rockets and bounced around the G league, of course, had some of the, um, anxiety issues. And, and I believe, you know, just overall off the court things that kept him from, from being in the league. Um, but as a prospect, his body type and the way he plays reminds me a lot of Royce White, which is which is a good thing. Royce White was fantastic as a prospect, uh, was fantastic as a collegiate player, certainly. Um, so that's that's kind of where my head's at when it comes to Sohan, where he's just kind of a big point forward. Um, I, I don't think he's as good of a pass. You know, I, I don't know about a Ben Simmons comp in terms of the combination of size and what he does, maybe. But I think he's even got more touch offensively than Ben Simmons. Um, it, so I, I think he would certainly fit the Timberwolves. The only real red flag and red flags, maybe not the right term is he's not a super consistent shooter. Uh, he, well, he's got good touch in the paint, which kind of portends like, Hey, maybe he can add some range to his jumper. He was under 60% at the free throw. He's like 57, 57 and a half percent. He was under 32% for catch and shoot threes. Um, but his, uh, his ability to score in the paint, his touch, He's a good enough rebounder, I think, to play the four consistently at the NBA level and maybe even the five in a small ball situation. Uh, I, I think the touch tells us that he may be able to extend the um, the the range on the jumper. So really, the biggest thing is is the jumper, uh, which is the only reason he's not higher. I mean, if he had a jumper, he'd probably be a top five pick anyway because of the size and defensive ability. So, um, you know, the shot is really the only issue, which is obviously a big issue for the Timberwolves, a team that shoots the most threes. Uh, you know, one of the highest three point rates in, mo in most threes per game, I think third highest three point rate in most threes per game last year in the NBA in the regular season for the wolves. So it's a big deal. If you have, if you pick somebody in the first round that can't shoot, but again, that's something that could be developed and he's so good defensively and can score a bit inside can rebound other things. The wolves need, you know, if he were to fall to like, I don't know this range, like 10 to 12. I mean, there's some other guys we're going to talk about that. I like a lot too. And some guys I talked about the other day, yesterday that I liked a lot, but he's another guy you'd consider trading a pick to move up and get because, again, if he develops that shot, he could be a star. I mean, the the body type and the defensive ability is already there. The feel um, is there. So it's a big enough issue that, like, it's, you know, if he could shoot, I'd be like, okay, there's no way this guy should get past number 10. Like, the, the Wolves should trade up and go get him. I'm not there because the shooting's an issue. But if he's there, like in the late lottery, and the Wolves could slide up a few spots to get him, he's an intriguing prospect who'd immediately fix. If you said, what are the Wolves' problems? I've, I've done this exercise before, but what do they need most? You'd say, could, you'd, you'd say always on-ball perimeter defense, rebounding, and uh, uh, paint, essentially, uh, rim protection, you know, paint protection. And Sohan, like, he half- fixes all of that, right? Because he can play small ball five. He's a decent shot blocker, uh, you know, not necessarily as a five, but as a three or as a four switchable defensively. And he would add a level of toughness uh, to the team. So I think you'd have to take a look at him if he were to fall, you know, really past, I don't know, 
seven, eight, nine, ten. He's probably he's probably going to go in that range, and I probably have him a little bit higher in my Timberwolves big board than other teams do. So once he's in that range, he's somebody you could look at, at potentially going to get. All right, two more players to talk about today. I want to talk about the pack, or excuse me, the uh, the Big Twelve Player of the Year, and then uh, one of the better shooters in the Big Ten here next. First of all, let's talk about our friends, our new friends over at Arcade One Up. Boom shakalaka. We have big news. The one, the only NBA jam is back. Arcade one up. The leader in at home retro arcade games is not only bringing the best game ever back, but they made it bigger than ever with a wait for it. Shack edition machine. People are obsessed with NBA jam. And I'm thrilled to tell our listeners that you can once again, play hoops with NBA legends in this arcade classic, jump clear across the court and set the ball on fire in one of the first sports games ever to feature real and digitized NBA licensed teams. No fouls, no free throws, and no quarters required. Compete with friends and family through all new Wi-Fi leaderboards, making you more connected than ever. Pre-order now from Arcade1Up.com. That's Arcade, the number one, up.com for an estimated early September ship date. Arcade One Up is the place for fun. They've got even more classics like Golden Tee, Mortal Kombat, and many others starting at just $3.99. Check this out. They're giving away an NBA Jam Shack Edition to a Lockdown listener. Enter now for a chance to win a game console for your man cave at arcadeoneup.com slash locked on. That's arcade, the number one up.com slash locked on. You've got till July 8th to enter to win NBA Jam Shack Edition console. Don't miss out. Enter today. Thanks again for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. The Ultimate NBA Mock Draft starts on June 16th with over 50 insiders. Nothing equals the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. The NBA Lockdown, excuse me, the Lockdown NBA Big Board Draft experts plus the Odyssey and his insiders will be there. First pick is June 16th. That's in two days. That's this Thursday. Search Ultimate NBA Mock Draft and follow now so you don't miss a pick. All right, uh, let's go to the next player on my big board. And that is... Uh, Next player on the big board is Ochai Baji, the wing out of Kansas. I talked about him, I think, last week as a player that has a shot at falling to 19 to the Wolves. He's starting to get mocked a little bit higher if you if you look around. So, like, for instance, the Ringers' most recent mock draft, I believe, had him significantly higher. Um, yeah, it's got him at 13. He was, for a while, getting mocked further down towards the Wolves. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about him in the future. But if... Abaji is still there as the Wolves are getting closer. Another player the Wolves could look at, hey, does a second round, you know, do a pair of second rounders this year, a second rounder this year, and a future second rounder? Does that slide us up a couple of spots? Maybe we, maybe it's a like, I, I don't know, maybe it's Jalen Noel in a second rounder to move up a little bit, something like that, where you're giving up a little bit of value to move up in the draft. Um, but Ochai Abaji is a pretty perfect fit for the Timberwolves. Um, the only reason that he's, that he's fallen is that he's really just a three and D guy, right? Like he, he has offensive upside, but at the college level, he hasn't really demonstrated the ability to distribute, to facilitate, but those are things that the wolves don't need out of this year's draft pick. They have Anthony Edwards, they have Carl Anthony towns. They love running offense through both of those guys. Um, and at the moment, D'Angelo Russell is still on this roster and you've still got Patrick Beverly and you've got Jordan McLaughlin who you're comfortable running some offense. You don't need somebody who is going to be a primary ball handler. You just need someone um, who's well-rounded and can do everything else. And he does that. The only other reason he'd fall is that he was a senior. So he's 22 years old already. He's older, old in terms of prospect, uh, in prospect terms. But you start to get to the late lottery, late teens. You're talking about playoff teams already. They don't care if he's a little bit older, if he's going to be a plug-and-play rotation guy. And that's what Abaji is in my mind. He's a fantastic spot-up shooter. He shot over 41% this year on more than 200 attempts from three for Kansas. He's got a quick release. He knows how to get his shots in transition. He finds the open. He runs to the corners, sprints to the corners in transition, finds open spots on the floor in the half court. Has a quick enough release and enough size. He's 6'5 with a 6'10 wingspan, so long arms. He's able to get his shots off over contests. He also shoots really well in dribble handoff action, which is really important in Chris Finch's offense. Uh, the Wolves do a lot of that with Anthony Edwards. And Ant's pretty good shooting off dribble handoffs, but he's much better when he gets downhill and can make a decision going to the basket. Abaji is going to be a guy who shoots, and, and and that's 
part of the thing is he he's not going to put the ball on the floor and get to the basket a ton on, on dribble handoffs. But if he can, if you can run a set where you've got Anthony Edwards and Abaji both on the floor, they're both threats to shoot from three. And uh, Ant is a threat to get the ball and go to the basket. And Abaji, another thing he's really good at is as a cutter. He's a really smart player. And so if he can set up a team with you, you can set him up with two, three sets where he's popping out for open three point attempts. The teams know he can shoot a three. Then all of a sudden he's cutting back door for a lob, um, whether it's a design play or just a feel. Um, he actually would fit really well with D'Angelo Russell. D'Lo is, is a decent lob thrower, but really good at hitting cutters. And Abaji's great at lobs, very good at cutting, smart to read, uh, smart when it comes to reading the defense. And his jumper can set up all of that. Uh, because he's such a good shooter. So he really is is a slightly bigger, um, certainly at this point, higher upside version of Malik Beasley in the sense that he can get so much of his offense in transition, whether it's getting to the basket in transition or running to the three-point line or as a cutter. Um, and he's going to, because of his size and, and the uh, he's got a, a little bit of a bigger wingspan, a little bit more length than Beasley, he's going to be a little bit more of a lob threat, um, although that probably is less the case in the NBA than it was at Kansas. He's also a really good defender. He's consistent everywhere um, in, in terms of his defense. Uh, he could play on the ball, off the ball. He would immediately improve the Timberwolves' perimeter defense. And uh, again, not a, not great off the dribble in terms of shooting or creating, and he's not a distributor, but that's not important for the Timberwolves if you're picking at 19 or if you're trading up a little bit to get somebody that's very plug-and-play. If the Wolves took him, it would have set, he would essentially fill Malik Beasley's role. Um, and I, I don't know that the value would quite be there to like – Say so you get into the mid teens, and that's where you can a lot of times trade uh, uh, a current NBA player straight up for one of those picks. I mean, think about the Wolves' history. And this hasn't really changed. I mean, not too distant past the Wolves traded like the 16th pick or something for Martel Webster. They traded the 18th pick for Chase Budinger a couple years after that. So there's some track record there for teams to do that. I mean, the Wolves could trade just straight up Malik Beasley for like a pick in the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 range. Of course, then you have two first rounders, which I don't know that that's necessary, but then maybe you move the 19 for something in the future. But, and I'm not at all advocating for like Beasley for Abaji straight up. I, I don't know that that would be the best move, um, but I kind of don't hate it because Beasley wants the ball more. Abaji's, you know, not going to expect that as a mid first round pick right away. And he's plug and play in terms of three and D he's a better defender than Beasley. You could have an argument he'd be a better bench piece right now than Beasley because he's a better defender. And um, and I just think that I, you know Beasley has higher expectations than what his role was this year, certainly. And there's a team out there, potentially a team in this range, in the you know 10 to 12 range. I mean, you look at the teams that are drafting there. Uh, you know, the Thunder aren't going to want him. The Knicks maybe at 11. The Hornets at 13. You know, Beasley, Beasley could fit there. He's not, you know, they're going to be looking for some perimeter defense. He could fit the Cavs at 14, the Hornets again at 15, the Hawks at 16. I mean, at that point, you're only moving up three spots. But those are all teams that, you know, could Beasley be a fit? If so, could you trade him straight up to move up just a little bit and take a Baji? There's always a chance he slides to 19 too. I mean, that's certainly a possibility. All right. One more player to talk about here today, and that is a uh, I, Baji was the uh, obviously the Big 12 player of the year, but one of the better shooters in the Big 10 um, who was really good uh, from outside the arc in the NCAA tournament. We're going to talk about him next. First, though, let's talk about our friends over at Rock Auto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have a computer with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket, save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do it yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every customer, and they have everything you could possibly need from brake parts to tail lamps, motor oil to even new carpet. Go explore their easy to use website today to find the solutions your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck, right? Locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. All right, let's close today's show by talking about uh, one more player, and that's Malachi Branham. 
Malachi Branham is a wing for Ohio State, 6'5", 6'10", uh, wings, which is the same size as Abaji. He's a really good shooter, can get a shot off anywhere, but the volume on three-point attempts is relatively low, especially compared to a guy like Abaji. For instance, this is relevant because we just talked about Abaji. He, they, from Kansas, he had 200-plus attempts. Branham, I think, was under 50 attempts from three, but was good in the tournament shooting from deep. He's really good as a pull-up shooter from any other spot on the floor. He's really good in the mid-range. Um, he's not super quick, but he has some explosiveness. Uh, he can speed up his release if he needs to. He's big enough with the 6'10 wingspan. He's got enough length to be able to get the shot off from most places on the floor. He doesn't have a huge bag of tricks with his dribble, but he's a pretty good ball handler. Like you watch him last year at Ohio State. He wasn't he wasn't too fancy. He wasn't finessing his way to the rim. He just kind of used a strong low dribble. He's got a spin move that he uses quite a bit can get to where he wants on the floor. And because of the quick release and the touch he's got, he can score from anywhere in the mid range. He can also get all the way to the rim. He's not ultra athletic again, but somewhat surprisingly explosive when he does jump. Uh, he likes to jump off two feet, um, which can telegraph things a bit because if teams know that, if they pay attention to the scouting report, they can plan for it and block the shot. You know, defenders can recover, help side can come and get a block shot. If he's jumping off both feet, it takes him a minute to gather but it also allows him a little bit more explosion. And so if you can catch a defender on their heels, he's going to have a little bit more success scoring at the rim. Um, in fact, offensively, he reminds me quite a bit of Jalen Noel. Um, maybe not as good of a passer as Noel. Uh, Noel obviously ran some point this last year, and, and he's has a little bit more experience distributing the ball. But he's bigger, a little bit bigger than Jalen Noel, and he's got a bit more balance and plays with more composure. Noel occasionally gets sped up a little bit, but he can get a bucket from all three levels. And Branham's very likely the same way. There's a little bit of concern with, is he really that good of a three-point shooter because of the low volume? He didn't shoot it well prior to college. It's kind of a surprise this year. He's a surprise one and done, really, because he just was such a good shooter. So there is a little concern there, which is why I have him you know, clearly below Sohan and, and Abaji, because in my mind, there's, there's a possibility. Last year was an outlier in a good way for Branham. But maybe the, you know, the form's good. It's a little bit it's a quickish release. It looks a little awkward in my mind. It's he kind of shoots the ball forward more than up. And that worries me a little bit. Um, but I mean, one full season isn't exactly a tiny sample size. So clearly at the very least, there's some improvement there. And if you've got the touch to score in the mid range and get your shot off from anywhere, like a Jalen Noel, you can figure out stretching your range to three when you're a professional basketball player. And, and you can, I still think he'll be able to get to the rim a little bit at the NBA level. So I like him offensively. Defensively, again, the size is good, and theoretically, he should be a good defender. I, I don't know that he right now is that, but the size is nice, and he's athletic enough. It appears as though he's quick enough laterally. The biggest issue is that he's he doesn't he's not very physical, uh, which is an issue for the Wolves, right? They need physicality. He doesn't get through screens very well. He doesn't get skinny and get through screens. He just kind of lets himself be screened away, which is kind of shades of what D'Lo has done for most of his career. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of wolves, you know, Ant has that problem sometimes too, frankly. So he's got to fight through screens better. He also is a little bit sloppy in his closeouts, which with, with his length and athleticism, if he tightens that up, he should be able to contest jumpers on the perimeter with consistency and, and just improve some of the physicality. He's not going to move the needle much on the glass for his position, which is another issue for the wolves, but the offensive upside, the fact that he's, he's like a, in my mind, a little bit of a better version of Jalen Noel puts him here on my board. You know, I, I don't think he's a guy, you know, I talked about a couple guys. I don't know that you go up to get Sohan and let Sohan, unless he keeps sliding, I'd go up and get it by ab If he's, you know, in the, in that 10, 12 range, uh, or, or if you're worried that he's going to go before 19, because again, there's a chance he gets to 19. Sohan's not going to Branham probably won't. I don't know that I would trade up to get him because I, I think you've got him in Jalen Noel, um, at a reasonable cost. So why add another one on another version of Noel, on a, but that, you know, certainly perhaps a higher ceiling given the size and, and some of the other stuff, but I don't know that I would spend an asset to go get him when you've got Jalen on the roster. So, uh, that's, that's where I'm at. I have Sohan at nine. I have a Baji at 10. I have Brandon at 11. We're getting ever closer to the wolves pick at 19. And with all these D rumors out there now, and the wolves three second round picks, there's always the chance that the wolves trade up in the draft. Um, and, uh, Tim Connolly kind of referenced that. We talked about that on Monday's show when he did the interview with John Krasinski of the athletic that it's absolutely a possibility given the assets, all the future picks, right? The Wolves have all of their future picks plus the two second rounders this year. 
So there's the possibility the Wolves could move up and get somebody. And of the guys I've talked about so far through the first 11 on my big board, the guys I think you'd move up for, Ibaji if he slides, Matherin I think would be an option. I really don't think they're going to get up into the top six and you're not going to get like a Keegan Murray. I, I have him at four in my big board and a lot of mocks are starting to put him up at four now too. So realistically, I mean, Matherin and uh, and Ibaji are the two that I've talked about that if they get to the 10-ish range, the Wolves could look to go and get them. All right, that's all I have for you in the show here today. We'll, of course, keep an eye on the D'Lo rumors. If he's truly being shopped, perhaps there will be more concrete rumors, teams that are rumored to be interested. We'll keep an eye on that on the show. I'm also going to join Locked On Sports Minnesota this week to talk Wolves with uh, Ron Johnson over at Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube. So go check that show out. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's all upcoming this week. Of course, we're just a little over a week away from the draft now. The Locked On NBA mock draft is coming soon. There's a ton going on. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, uh, you can find this show anywhere, including YouTube, as well as Apple, Google, Spotify, and Odyssey. You can also follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, Lockdown Wolves is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Thanks again for making us your first listen. A reminder you can make your second listen, the Lockdown NBA Big Board Show. There's no better time of year to do that. Host Raphael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and author of the NBA Big Board Newsletter is joined by Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin, giving fans an in-depth look into the NBA draft, plus mock drafts, player rankings, and of course, big boards. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.